so we were we've received a, a few reports at this point a few indications for the pricing with the next generation iPhones and I think this is critical I think it's key I think it's a a massive factor right now you know I've been tracking the smartphone game the various smartphone releases and I've noticed just how important it's become to consumers based on the stuff I'm covering on the channel the videos we're putting out all the rest of it it just just the sentiment it appears to be really important to customers right now to get some level of value for money and also to be looking at smartphones just in general that are, are not at that hyper premium price point because right now it just doesn't seem like the time to be doing it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just a sense that I have right now mm -hmm. across the globe. Now, many manufacturers have already moved in this direction. We were talking about Google essentially just forgetting about flagships altogether and being like, no, nah, we need to be around 500 bucks. Or if we look at the 4A, even less than that, 350 bucks. Uh, companies like Samsung putting out the fan edition. Mm -hmm. Companies like OnePlus doing the Nord. Mm -hmm. It's across the board that people are thinking about, companies are thinking about delivering value. Now they've been able to do that mostly in absence of having Apple participate. Apple being absent from that competition Apple's been like, okay, fine, you guys have that. If we're going to do a budget, which they just did, and it seems to have done fairly well, then it's going to be an older model. Hmm. Or at least older in the sense of the form factor and everything else. It did have the new chip in it. Of course, I'm talking about the, the latest iPhone SE. Mm -hmm. And so Apple was like, okay, you have that to a certain extent. But now I'm sitting here, I'm looking at this report, which is corroborating older reports that the entry-level iPhone 12 is going to be 649. Hmm. And I look at that 649 and I compare it to those fan editions and I compare it to what, what Google's going to put out. I mean, the Pixel 5 is going to be 699. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, man, Apple's about to crush with this 649 option. Uh -huh. This is speculation. This is me uh, forecasting. which I do sometimes. Yeah. And it's fine, but that's all it is. Like, keep that in mind. It's mm -hmm. not fact. I'm not telling you how many units are going to move. I don't know, but my intuition is that a 649 iPhone, given the state of the world right now, as a little, little pick-me-up for somebody who's looking for a new phone, they can get that badge on it. They can get that brand. Yep. And in a, in a smaller form factor, which we've already seen what the taste buds were like on that, with mm -hmm. the SE. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we had this uh, this report. It actually came in the form of a tweet before it was written about on Tom's Guide. It puts the iPhone 12 mini, the 5.4-inch iPhone 12, at 649 to start for the 64-gigabyte version. And then all the way up to 799 if you need 256 gigs of storage. But the critical item in there for me is that 649 starting price. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go up to the bigger iPhone 12 non-mini, 6.1-inch display, that's going to start at 749 and Pro Max will start at 1100 We already know what the story is with Pro Max. Nobody expected anything different. It's maxed. It's the max. You pay the max. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go for the 12, uh, 512 variant, according to this report, we're up to 1399 USD. You know what that is in Canadian funds, Willie, do? It's if, getting close to a paycheck. Yeah. Like, uh, what, 1500 or something? You know I go to the Starbucks, uh, right? Yeah. Okay, so... I go to the Starbucks and I've been using the Z Fold 2. Okay. And man, when I go to pay, when I go to tap to pay, I'm there's so much attention with this thing, with this yeah. Z Fold 2, because people see it and they watch you approaching the payment because with the Starbucks app, you scan the code. So it's not like a tap and go. They actually look at the phone and target it with their little gun. So you have it like still folded. It's folded up. Okay. No, I'm not trying to flex. Who's trying to even... Right at the beginning. I, I, I actually try to be sort of sub, uh, subdued about it, but you can't hide it's it. It's like, people, hey, what's that brick? They what know because they see so many phones. So many yeah. people use the app. That looks irregular. And they just scan them all day long and they're like, hey, what's that? Yeah. And so I'm showing it off in the drive-thru. Mm. And uh, at some you point... You open it up. You have to open yeah, it I'm, up. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a demo. Yeah. As you would, because people they're demanding it. You're so Mr. I, Samsung at that point. Yeah, I'm Mr. Samsung. I'm doing a demo. Because they're, I, hey man, they're asking for it. I'm not, yeah. you know. And uh, uh, the question comes about price. Mm. And it's uncomfortable. Mm. 
the thing is two G's. All right. Here, here in Canadian funds, it's more than that. And it's something st stood out to me. Okay. The, 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 the question of price comes up and I don't want to say the price. So I just say, ah, oh, it's kind of expensive. And then the girl working there said, sounds like it's a paycheck. And I was like, wow. Hmm. I was like, wow, it's an interesting way to think about it. And of course, a paycheck is different around the world. Uh -huh. But it's a lot of money yeah. to somebody. Yeah. And that's really important to remember. It's a lot of money to somebody. And, and this is where it all comes together. The idea that you can have an iPhone for $649 is going to satisfy a lot of buyers. A new iPhone. They can get mm -hmm. the newest model, not a special edition, but an iPhone 12 for 649. So my speculation, my intuition is that if Apple hits that number, they will crush. All right, you hear that, Tim? I mean, Tim already knows it because he set the price. To yeah, he knows. I don't have to yeah. tell Tim. But uh, shout out to Tim anyways. Yeah, shout out. In case he forgot. You were on the couch with him the other day, right? That's right. Yeah, we were chilling yeah. playing video games over there. I don't know if anybody caught playing that on Fortnite. Twitter. I don't know if anybody ca caught that, but he was playing Xbox. I was playing PlayStation. There it is. Shout out to Fotis, obviously. Shout out. Look at him. He yeah, looks like he lost. Well, of course he would. <laughs> look at my... Look at my look. <laughs> I'm staring him down. Yeah. Today's episode of Lou Later is brought to you by Built Basics, Built Clothing. You know the drill. I wear this stuff all the time. I got the drawer full of stuff. I don't have to think about it, Will. That's the mm. beauty of it. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy, I like to reach and go. I yeah. like to know the basics are right there. And it's not going to take too much bandwidth from me to figure out what I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. And that's what having a basic lineup in your wardrobe is all about. But it's got to be high quality. Because when it's a basic, there's no flashy graphic to throw people off. They're just going to analyze the basic like you do. When I first come in with it, you say, what's that texture? You start to pinch it a little bit. Yeah. You say, huh, what's that blend right there? It's like, why is it so stretchy and nice? Exactly. Yeah. And that's how you gauge it. So you can't, there's no shortcuts when you're doing, when you want to be known for your basics. You've got to do a good job on the mm -hmm. quality. And that's what I noticed with these guys. You wash it a bunch of times and it holds up. Unlike the cheaper basics that are out there that might not have the quality. These guys, they do the t-shirts, multiple blend choices for the t-shirts. Uh, they do the hoodies. Look, check the hoodie, which I wore today because the weather is, is it calls for the hoodie now mm -hmm. outside. But they they even launched a jacket now and and uh, they have pants and shorts and they got masks too. If you need a higher quality mask that you're wearing around or whatever you're up to, I noticed they got those now too. And the best part of it, Will, is uh, people, you can, you can actually save money right now with the code. It's unbox 22 for 22% off. You can see Willie Doo's doing a shopping right now. He's Oh, yeah. Picking I like out, these kinds of hoodies. He's picking out his favorite. Unbox22. You type it in. You can click the link in the description and then make sure to put in that code so you save money and you give it a shot and, and you try out some of these shirts and you let me know what goes on. You let me know what happens. You upgrade your basics. You upgrade your life. All of a sudden, everything takes a positive turn. Because people, people, they recognize the blend mm -hmm. as you did. And they mm -hmm. say, that's a high-quality garment you're wearing there, sir. And, yeah. and the logo is not pasted on. You know, it's uh, nice and subtle. That's what they do. So, yeah, once again, shout-out to Built Basics. Head to the link in the description. Don't forget the code, Unbox22. Apple put out a new audio feature. And it came out with iOS 14. And it kind of, like... It totally slipped my mind. I forgot about this feature when it was a, right. that it was an announced because I was curious about it. Mm. And but it's been a little while, and it finally rolled out. And now my curiosity, it's spiking. Yeah, it peaked. Peak. It might. It might even peak. Yeah. And this is uh this is that feature, which is going to attempt to give you a greater immersiveness inside of your AirPods Pro. Now, this is especially interesting to me for movie-style content. Hmm. Content with sound effects, spatial stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're doing all kinds of magic, all kinds of software magic, Will. So that when you're watching on your iPad, let's say, and you physically move, it's all correlated mm. to, your, 
to your position in space. It's like you're in the theater. Yeah, maybe it in is. In a way, right? Yeah, maybe you don't need a theater because you have the immersive spatial audio with your AirPods Pro because you gave Tim all the money that we talked about earlier. Mm. Now, not all devices are supported. You will need AirPods Pro, obviously, but then you'll also need an iPhone 7 or later. There's a list of iPad models that are supported, more recent ones. And uh, iOS 14 has to be installed, and you need audio-visual content from a supported app. So I'm going to give you an idea of some of the streaming apps that are going to be good for this. The AirPods Pro will convert 5.1 channel, 7.1 channel, or Dolby Atmos digital audio into a virtual surround experience. This will work with Vudu, Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, HBO Go, and Max, Amazon Video, Apple TV Plus app is in there as well. So, I don't know, pretty much everywhere you're going to be watching your movies and stuff like that. It looks to be supported. And uh, according to the initial reports here, this is apparently a very nice, a very compelling experience. So I can say now, having uh, having been reminded of this, I am going to I'm going to do a video on Unbox Therapy reacting to this spatial audio. I will check out some Netflix. I will check out some Dolby, and I will be in space. Maybe I I was gonna do it originally with the phone, but now that I'm thinking about it. It should be the big iPad. Yeah. Or maybe both. Watch uh, 2001. 2001. Yeah. My favorite. And and I'm going to move my head around and I'm going to let you know what's going on. Mm. So keep it locked to Unbox Therapy because I might go film this right after this episode mm. is completed. I might take my butt over there. I might up, update to iOS 14 and just be in space, spatially aware. Mm. Could be very compelling. We'll see. We'll find out. The Apple Watch heart rate sensor and ECG feature may do more harm than good. Well, that's a little rough. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. But, of course, the headline will get your attention, yep. as it would. Uh, Apple, in the commercials, they're always talking. On the presentations, they're always talking. Look, it saved that person's life right there. Mm -hmm. And you watch it and you say, that's mm -hmm. good stuff. Person's alive. I love it. ECGs for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out, Will, that there's some people that those those things don't work so well for. And in particular, young people. I don't know if you knew this. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this ECG technology on the wrist is uh, not intended for people under 22 years of age. Hmm. That's strange, isn't it? Yeah, the, why is that? Well, I guess the heart activity at that age is a little more sporadic. Oh. Quite possibly, or for whatever reason, the technology, the way it interacts, is it must be more uh, less reliable, I would guess, hmm. on somebody under 20. I don't know how they picked 22, but you know what I'm saying. They had a FDA had to draw the line somewhere. Hmm. And it also doesn't work very well for individuals who were previously diagnosed with some type of fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. Oh. So if you actually had the issue to begin with, probably that watch is popping off and you're like, no, no, no I know I have that issue. You know, I just mm -hmm. got to take my medication. Yeah, stop warning me. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. As far as doing more harm than good, here's how they broke down that headline. Uh, a, a number of people, they showed up to emergency rooms because the watch told them, hey, you might be in trouble and you're going to go. Mm -hmm. You might feel fine, but you're looking at the watch and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, Man, might as well. You know, I'm going to right? go get this checked out. Yeah. Now, for you, you might hit the emergency room over there and you just showed a health card because you got OHIP and everything else. Uh -huh. And it doesn't really affect you. Mm -hmm. If they say, no, you're fine. That watch is dumb. Will, you're under 22. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, I'm not. I'm not. Well, but but presuming you get a false positive, yeah. let's say, it doesn't hurt you that much. But what if you were under the age of 22 or you had a pre-existing condition and then you went in and you actually paid yeah. for that emergency room visit? Because you didn't have insurance or something, and then it could, I guess, in that case, it could do more harm. But you have to, you're not doing too well without a heart either. Uh huh. But anyway, they took some data from various Mayo Clinic sites in Minnesota, Arizona, Florida, Wisconsin, and Iowa. They had 264 patients who visited after having the irregular heart activity, which showed up on the Apple Watch. And out of those 264, only 30 
people uh, had new clinically actionable cardiovascular diagnoses of interest. Hmm. In other words, the vast majority didn't really have issues. Hmm. And so again, look, I'm not going with this headline that is doing more harm than good. I think if you're one of those 30 people, that's a big deal. Yeah. That your watch picked up a heart irreg irregularity that is actually going to get some treatment and may not turn into something terrible. But I do understand that uh, I would have wanted to know. I just feel it's not really well publicized yeah. that if you're under 22, it probably it, it isn't really approved for use for you. Yeah, maybe just a disclaimer. I'm sure it is somewhere. Mm. I'm sure it's listed somewhere, but it's just if you're watching this and you're under the age of 22, just keep that in mind that that particular feature may not function in the same way it does for people that are that are older or you may be more likely to get the the false positive when it comes to uh some sort of irregularity mm. with the heart behavior at least according to this particular report i guess the good news here is that most of these people were fine mm -hmm. and the other good news is the 30 that weren't they found out so i don't yeah. really go with the headline i don't think it's doing more harm than good but just be aware that the watch is not a replacement for an actual evaluation and it might not necessarily be right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure these disclaimers are in there somewhere, but whatever. App Store, the Apple App Store, apparently earned twice as much as the Google Play Store in Q3 2020. Oh. This is big because the install base of the Google App Store is enormous, obviously. But there's been this thinking for a while that, well, iPhone users are spending more in, in the iOS App Store. Keep in mind, by the way, this includes those in-app purchases. This includes the epic stuff that all the arguments are about with the 30 points and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Both of the app stores, the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, have been growing big time, especially recently. People spending more money inside of their favorite apps, becoming more comfortable with the idea. So here's growth from 2019 to 2020 for the same quarter, Q3. You have $21.6 billion. Uh, oh, those are the, that's the total number of downloads. So, which I guess is also a significant, it's worth looking at. In Q3 2019, you had 20 plus 21.6 billion Google Play downloads of apps compared to 8 billion in the iOS app store. So fewer apps downloaded on iOS, but for more money generated. Mm. That's up to 28.3 billion in Q3 2020 for Google Play and 8.2 billion for iOS. Okay, so the number of apps downloaded didn't increase by that much, but when you look at the spending, you scroll down to the next graph, that's where it gets wild. Mm. Apple goes from 14.5 billion spending in the App Store to 19 billion, a nice, a nice smooth little almost 5 billion improvement. Mm -hmm. And Google Play goes from 7.7 .7 billion same period last year to 10.3 billion this year. And of course the iOS app store looking at almost twice as much revenue. Mm -hmm. And this revenue takes into to account, as you know, not just, Hey, I bought an app, mm -hmm. but more importantly, that's my monthly subscription fee mm -hmm. or that's my V bucks. It goes right into Apple's wallet. 30% of it yeah. does. And it sure looks like it's paying off big time. So some might be wondering, well, wait a sec. Why? If you have so many more installs and so many more app downloads on the Google Play side, why is it not generating a one-to-one -one ratio? And many have attempted to look into this. iPhones are more expensive to begin with in most cases, meaning that user may, may have more discretionary income to spend within the App Store. Some would argue that the App Store experience makes you more comfortable with some level of spending. Uh, but it could also be policies around that 30% cut and how each store treat, may treat it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, if you scroll down a little more, you can see what some of the top apps in that same quarter have been. You look at the TikTok domination at the top of the list for both Google Play and the App Store. Zoom is a big climber. YouTube is near the top, of course, for iOS because it's not on there by default. It's nowhere in the top list for Google Play because it's already on the device. You got Instagram, WhatsApp. This is pretty, there's not too many standouts, although Snack Video, 
is kind of interesting on Google Play. I've never used that application. And then on, on iOS, you have Netflix cracking the top 10, whereas on Google Play, Snapchat still owns a spot in the top 10. Mm. It's funny though, on iOS, you have to go get all your Google apps. Number nine is Google Maps, number mm. eight is Gmail, and number three is YouTube. Yeah. So you go and get your, imagine that, Will, you get your iOS device and you immediate, immediately load it with Google and Facebook. Yeah. You Number three, YouTube. Number four, Instagram. Number five, WhatsApp, owned by Facebook. Instagram, owned by Facebook. Number six, Facebook. Number seven, Messenger, owned by Facebook. Eight, Gmail. Nine, Google Maps. Ten, Netflix. Mm -hmm. Goes to show you how important these connections are. Yeah. What is your iPhone without that list of apps? Mm -hmm. How useful is it? Or how how non-useful i mean on the other side look telegram cracks in on google play as well mm -hmm. kind of interesting now if you scroll down to the next chart by the way shout out to sensor tower for these cool cool charts over here this is revenue and once again it's some TikTok domination overall for revenue which is weird right because what do you how do they determine TikTok's revenue in the app store yeah it must be based on advertising, right? Yeah, yeah. So you've got some ad revenue going on. That must explain why YouTube is number two as well. Tencent Video, Tinder in the App Store is number four for revenue hmm. because Still Apple's hot. getting that 30% piece, I guess. Oh, for like a premium account. Yeah, Which I know Tinder. nothing about, but yeah. it, what is that, like 10 bucks? I, I have no idea. 20 bucks? I don't know what a premium, but Apple gets their piece. Netflix, Disney Plus, et cetera. It's a really interesting list. It's not they're not in the, in there. There's not a single app that you just pay for up front, mm. which goes to show you how important this revenue structure, which is under attack from Epic, how important it is to these platforms. Mm -hmm. A bit of a surprise on Google Play. Google One is the first app, which I guess kind of makes sense because they're trying to encourage you to get the storage and whatever else going right. on. Yeah. But uh, anyways, interesting stuff to look at. And a little bit different depending which platform you're on, but total lump sum figures, 20 billion in a quarter for Apple and 10 billion in a quarter for Google Play. And it's a huge increase from the same period last year. So they don't want to give up those 30 points. It's big money. No. It's big money. Speaking of that big money, they might not be so happy about it in India. You have to remember here, we just looked at two separate charts there ios and android mm -hmm. and what epic is calling a duopoly mm. however in india almost no one uses iphones i've seen numbers as high as 99 percent of mobile users smartphone users being on android so the argument in india is forget about a duopoly that's a monopoly yeah which is obviously a level above a duopoly it's like wow we want to yeah. target those guys well there was this incident that took place. There's an app called Paytm, which is uh, it's a financial services app that got kicked out of the Play Store. Is it, is it Pay? Paytm? Or pay is it Paytm? I don't know. Oh, okay. Paytm, Paytm. Someone's going to correct us. Yeah, Obviously, sure. somebody knows. It's one or the other. It's either, yeah, it's one or the other. Willie Do seems to care a lot, though. Mm -hmm. So he just wants to get it right. I like I can say paid him faster. That's true. Oh, paid him. I paid him. Is that is that how it works? No, I don't know. I'm just uh, okay. Pay to him. You know what I mean? Okay. Did you pay him? Yeah, I paid him. <laughs> that could be their uh, motto. Their no, slogan. I'm just writing commercials now for this. Yeah, we'll anyway, it out. anyway, they got kicked out of the Play Store for whatever. Uh, violation perceived violation they got reinstated really quickly afterwards but they were a bit sour they were thinking to themselves man we spent all of our time building this app and it's kind of crazy that our only way to reach customers is via this one store a legit monopoly hmm. and so they started this tech startup consortium exploring the ability to launch a play store alternative away from google's control and a number of other indian app makers Kind of like the idea. They were sitting there thinking, man, what if my app gets kicked off that store as well? I have nowhere else to go. Now, I don't see why they couldn't do this because unlike on iOS, you know this, as long as you check the little box to install 
from sources other than the Play Store, which you can do, I think, on almost any on any Android phone. Mm -hmm. Presumably, you could put any store you want on there. Mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah. It would have to be loaded after the fact, but I think this is possible if they want to do this. Uh, but as far as having that pre-installed, that could be an issue. Because we've heard about this in the past. OnePlus ran into an issue. They were trying to pre-install the Epic launcher. Mm -hmm. And then Google didn't like it that much. And they said, hey, we're going to screw up your launch or your mm -hmm. how quickly we respond to your software inquiries. I don't know what level of control Google would ex uh try to have over a manufacturer that said, oh yeah, also we're going to ship the device with that store already installed. Although Samsung's done it successfully with the Samsung store. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. We'll see how it maps out. But it makes the argument, the duopoly argument, look kind of funny mm -hmm. when you compare it to the Indian market where nine, potentially 99% of mobile apps are coming through one store. Mm-hmm. Legit. Yeah, it's a lot of power. A lot of power. Google is going to turn off selfie retouching by default with the new Pixel phones. I love it. Hmm. I love it. I always, in the videos, people know this. I go evaluate a phone and I immediately have to turn off whatever kind of beauty stuff is happening to me. And often, Will, I can't even really turn it off. No. Oftentimes, I click the off button and then I'm examining myself. I'm like, I don't look this pretty. I look prettier now. Yes. It's like, what? Yes, I go and I examine the complexion and I'm too smooth. Yeah. That was actually an Apple selfie right there with the green in the background. You see my model pose? Anyway, yeah. uh, so I'm always, my first thing is to turn off as much beauty as I can. On the Apple devices, I started to feel like I couldn't get it all off. Whatever algorithmic fancy stuff was going on was just smoothing me out. Mm-hmm. Now, on the Pixel phones, I felt it wasn't as aggressive, but apparently starting on the Pixel 5, Pixel 5, Pixel 4, starting on the Pixel 4, they did put in some kind of beauty mode. I don't know if they called it beauty or not, but they're going to get away from it, and I applaud them for this. If I have the ability to turn it on, I don't mind, but by default, let me start with what I, what I actually look like uh -huh. instead of assuming that I need work. Mm-hmm. And so apparently they really thought long and hard about this. And this is the quote from, from Google themselves. When you're not aware that a camera or photo app has applied a filter, the photos can negatively impact mental well-being. They said this on a Google blog post. Yeah. Because it's implying kind of immediately that you need, you're going to need some help over mm -hmm. there. You're mm -hmm. pretty rough looking. Yeah. <laughs> you 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 click on the photo and you see whatever blemish you had or is just smoothed out. Yeah. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, oh my God, that that is terrible. I am terrible. Like this this is mm -hmm. what they're saying. This is yeah. what they're saying. I mean, it was never that catastrophic for me. But if uh, you take like, you know, a hundred pictures a day and they're all smooth, then that's a problem. Because if you look in the mirror, it's like that's not a reflection. Could of be. You know, Could be. Mode. And then what about the mental health of everybody else that looks at them and then they look at themselves yeah, and then it's yeah. just whatever's round and round. Honestly, for me, when I take the selfie photo, I just want it off because I want to test the resolution of the front facing camera. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I, I actually want to see as much detail as possible. And often these smoothing things, they remove a certain amount of detail and I notice it. So that's where I'm coming from. Anyways, by default, it's turned off. You can turn it on, but it's going to be more subtle. They're going to have a subtle setting as well. So it's not so overwhelming, the retouch. But I have to applaud them for doing this. Uh, I just, uh, you know, the closer to reality to start, the better as far yes. as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Apple is working on a self-healing display for a foldable device. This uh, this is a thing I've seen before with certain screen protectors. It's a thing I've seen before with certain plastics. It's a, it's a thing I've seen certain case companies. I believe it was a case company called Inner Exile, which had a self-healing material on the outside of the case. So if it got scratched or something over time, that thing would heal up. Now, that would take a while. And so this 
the details on this potentially self-healing display for an Apple device are kind of interesting because it's talking about an ability to almost heal on demand. And apparently the way this would work is through the application of heat, a heat layer mm. that when you plug in the device to charge would become initiated and then go in there and seal up any little micro mm. scratches in there. Mm. How crazy is that? Very cool. Now, Very sci-fi. it's something I noticed with the Z Fold 2. By default, out of the package, you have a kind of soft screen protector on there. Some people peeled it off on this one successfully. Oh. Some people don't like it at all. I don't mind that much. When it comes to durability on a device like this, you're already yeah. a little more concerned about it. So I can live with that. And I found something kind of bizarre, which was since it has a little tackiness to it, unlike glass, I've actually found the split typing to be a little bit more accurate for me because the thumb isn't as likely to slide over to the next character. Mm. I don't know. Kind of a crazy, weird, extra thing that I noticed. But definitely the swiping on the display, not as smooth, not as... Just for people who are wondering what to expect, mm -hmm. it's one of the things you live with, with a foldable display and also the durability questions. Well... That's what Apple is aiming to uh, to to solve here with their folding, potentially folding iPhone, which is, I mean, they got to be working on it. Who knows how far it would be in the future? Here's the word from them. Displays are typically formed from rigid planar substrates. Although satisfactory in many situations, rigid displays such as these may be difficult to integrate into certain devices, such as devices with bendable housings. During operation... Of an electronic device, the display cover layer for the electronic device may be scratched or dented. To improve the aesthetics of the electronic device, it may be desirable for the presence of scratches and dents to be minimized. To help mitigate the number of dent scratches or other imperfections in a display cover layer, the display cover layer may include self-healing material. And then it goes on to talk about heat being used as the stimulus for the healing the display cover layer may include transparent conductors that form a heating layer in the display cover layer. To generate heat to stimulate self-healing, the heating layer may be used to generate heat in response to user input according to a predetermined schedule or when the device is charging. W what a wild wow. concept. Substrate. I, I don't imagine this being right around the corner by any means. Mm-hmm. But it is such a cool idea that your phone is charging and also self-healing any little nick that may have taken place on a display. Yeah. It's such a futuristic feeling and idea. So mm -hmm. anyway, at least Apple's thinking about it. Tesla doing really good, Will. Hmm. I don't know if you knew. They just had a record number of deliveries in Q3. And by record, I mean record all time. Hmm. 139,300 vehicles delivered. Not purchased, delivered, which is big for Tesla because it's always been, Elon will always say this. He's like, people think inventing the thing is the hard part. Manufacturing is the hard part. Oh, yeah. Actually doing it at scale with perfection, with quality control, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so deliveries are what people really like to track with Tesla to see what, what track they're on. Yeah. Like what's the actual outcome? Yes. Yes. You know. What's the output? Where are the satisfied customers? How long are people waiting? So if they can deliver vehicles, it shows they're a real company doing real things. And this 139,300 actually breaks their previous record, which was Q4 2019. And that was 112,000 vehicles. And it's a big jump over the last quarter, which was 90,000. You got to remember, Will, not too many people are splashing out for fifty to $100,000 cars with COVID out there. Mm -hmm. People are waiting. And the, the, the sector, when it comes to the gasoline vehicles or the average dealership, is hurting big time. And Tesla can still pump record numbers. Mm. So it's also, it's not just record numbers for them. It's, it's, it's also, where does that, how does that line look? How does that trajectory look compared to the rest of the industry? Mm -hmm. So people are... People are loving it. They're hot about it. And as far as the delivery breakdown, as you might expect, it's mostly Model 3 and Y. Out of the 139-300, 124,100 were Model 3 and Y, and only 15,200 were Model S and X. Hmm. 
So it once again, once again showcases what we've talked about so many times, how with Tesla right now, it's all about the three and the Y. Mm -hmm. And you got to be a little crazy to be buying the other two because they're kind of dated, to be honest. And more expensive. More expensive. Yeah. And kind of date the dated part for me is more important. Yeah. I, I just, it just, I can't get as excited. I'm a tech fan. It's all like, what's new? What's mm -hmm. new? Mm -hmm. Even the Plaid model, which was kind of, it's new because you got the extra motor and the thing's flying. But then I was like, it's not really all new though. Mm. And the Y and the three, they got that new, especially the Y. Mm. It's the newest one. Mm. Now, I'm not in the market for a car like that, but if I was in the market for a Tesla, I'd be looking at the why, I feel like. But even even there, you have people on, on, on YouTube posting their quality control stuff. Right. And so even delivering these vehicles, even once people have them, it's the follow-up, it's everything else. Yeah, it never ends. That's a lot of vehicles, dude. Yeah. So shout out to Tesla breaking a record. And uh, shout out to the Model Y, I guess. Speaking of uh, electric vehicles, though, Look at this! Look at this guy right here, the Taycan Cross Turismo, spied with little to no camouflage. Oh. You know what Cross Turismo means, Will? Can you guess when you look at that image? No. It can go cross country or something. Yeah, it's got the hatchback on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you instead of a trunk, you got a hatchback on it, and so it's going to be better for the road trip. Oh. Yeah, uh, it looks nice. But it's still the same. It's basically the same car. It should have the same capabilities. In this particular article on Autoblog, they did mention it looks a little higher off the ground, but it's still a car, right? It's not an SUV. Mm. It's still a car, but you get the extra utility of the hatchback and the extra cargo space. And probably if you fold down those rear seats, you're going to have quite a bit of cargo space. I think it's pretty good looking. Yeah. It's not bad for yeah, what yeah. it is. I mean, I wouldn't trade it for a regular Taycan, but... If it has similar performance figures with a little extra space back there, that's kind of cool. Uh huh. What do you take, this or a Model Y? Mm, I would take this. You this would take looks that? better, I think. It looks yeah. better, yeah. It's so, lacking the autonomous features, but I, I think I agree. I think it looks a little less uh, bulgy compared to the yeah, Model it looks Y. It's like a bubble. The, the y. Model Y is a yeah. very bubbly thing. However, I doubt this is going to have the same level of utility as the Y. It's going to be a little extra space, but I don't think the actual inside volume is going to increase quite as much. Uh -huh. uh, but I, yeah, I think it looks pretty cool. They've done this in the past. So they have a version of the Panamera, which is the, the Turismo, the Cross Turismo, I suppose, which has the hatchback as well. Mm. So there's a couple options, and I'm not surprised that they brought it to the Taycan as well. The Atlanta Falcons are going to use disinfecting drones... To clean their stadium because they want to invite they want to invite fans back mm. into the stadium in a limited number. They're not going to pack the place, obviously. And I think this is so cool. Mm. I can it just feels so anime to me. It feels so futuristic. It, it reminds me of I don't remember which anime I was watching back in the day. One of the classic ones. You watch anime? No, I mean not really, but in the old days, and there was like this street cleaner robot in Japan. I don't remember which anime it was. And it was it had no driver, but it was just cleaning the streets. And uh, this reminds me of that, where, where you could have robots just kind of autonomously keeping things clean, tidying up after us. We're disgusting yeah, humans. After, you know, everyone leaves, they kind of just pick up. We're such a mess. We make a mess everywhere we go, and then the robots can tidy it all up. I just, it's such a cool idea. So this is the robot that they're going to use, the drone. It's uh, spraying some disinfectant, and it can be very efficient. They can, uh, it can head over the seats, and it can have full coverage because, you know, it's not going to have a lapse and miss a spot. It's all. Yeah, they can do it all night, too. Programmed in yeah. advance. So it's a pretty cool implementation now. Uh, it's not the only thing they're going to use in the stadium either because it's good for the seats and the open section. But of course, in a stadium, you also have the inside portions mm -hmm. and you have the locker rooms and you have the the uh, areas where people would enter. Mm -hmm. So they're going to actually use the other robot for that. 
the UV robot. You know, you've seen that one before. They were using it in warehouses oh, as yeah. well, and they also use it in healthcare. So they can have that one going around the inside, and then the drones are going around the outside, mm. and it's full robotic cleanup, and I love it. I'm in the future. Yeah, that's great. So, again, there's going to be social distancing. They're not going to fill the stands, but they can have, I guess they can have a few fans in there. Mm. Speaking of disinfecting things, almost 20,000 Amazon workers in the U.S. test positive for COVID-19. Mm. 20,000. It's such a huge number, and the headline shocked me. But then I read the article, and I realize how many people Amazon employs. Mm. And all of a sudden, I have to start talking like this. Mm. Because it's actually, they Amazon has a comeback, and they say, oh, yeah, no, no, actually, uh, we have so many employees that this number of positive tests is below the average for just the general public. Mm. And you're like, what? So you know what that means? That means that Amazon employees, they have 1.4 million workers. 1.4 million workers, what? And they said that this number of positive tests was 42% lower than the rate they expected based on the broader U.S. population. Hmm. So they actually said, oh, yeah, we're doing a great job. Yeah. But I'm looking at 20,000 and thinking. Yeah, it's a high number. Sheesh. So there's some people that are upset. They say that Amazon should still do better, even if it's below the average, because they're Amazon. And people have very high expectations for a company like Amazon and what they could implement. And of course, they're a technology company. So is there a way that they can automate the process of figuring this out sooner so people aren't in the warehouses? You know, Amazon never shut down. I got to shout out. If you work at Amazon, shout out because they, they you never stopped. Mm. When the first, when it hit at first, and people were really panicking and they didn't know if they could go places, you still had Amazon coming to the door. Yep. Yeah. It was very reliable. So I bought many things. As far Amazon as the essential COVID. aspect of that, shout out to anybody who was doing that work at that time, mm. working at Amazon. But anyway, there's a there's a group here called Athena, and they're an activist group, and they're campaigning for oversight over Amazon and they don't like Amazon and they said Amazon allowed COVID-19 to spread like wildfire in its facilities risking the health, health of tens of thousands of people they don't like Amazon they don't like billionaires they don't like billions and all yeah. the rest of it and hey man you got to have these organizations to keep tabs on it yeah but it's just it's a crazy the it's crazy to me to do the math and say oh they're below the oh they have 1.4 million mm. employees yeah, not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> 20,000, 1.4 million. You're sitting there thinking, my town's doing worse than that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know if this town is, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's possible. So anyway, if you're an Amazon employee, shout out. You're doing good work. Uh, okay, last story. You forced me to talk about this. You said, this is the biggest news today, Lou. You cannot not talk about this. And you're right. To a certain extent, this is a thing. It's a tough topic. It's a weird it's almost, it doesn't even, it's surreal. It doesn't, it's too many things 2020. It, yeah, it fits 2020. It's just kind of, it almost feels fictional. It feels like a story. It feels like a movie. Uh, Donald Trump tests positive for COVID in the middle of an election. Yes. With about, I don't know, 30 something days to go to this election debates scheduled tons i mean campaigning all kinds of interviews and things and 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 i'm trying to think about what to say about this other than it's the most 2020 thing you could imagine that mm -hmm. just when you had this this bubbling and this I mean, there's so much, the social media thing, it's so much tension. Mm -hmm. It's so much tension you feel, that debate. Mm -hmm. Tension and tightness. And you feel that there's no other level you can ratchet it up to, and then you get this news. This guy is, I think, 74 years old. He's the president of the United States at the moment. A very influential nation and all such 
COVID has been such a huge topic. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the mask conversation has been such a huge topic. And now he has COVID. And it's there's three ways this goes down. And this is what I was saying to you earlier. He beats COVID easily, let's say, emerges, and then the the base people, supporters yeah. that are watching say, I knew we could yeah. do it. You know, COVID didn't stand a chance. Mm. I'm ready to get back to work. Mm. Right? That's the number one. Number two, he has a rough go of it. People feel sympathetic, right? Because he's a human being, and that's the right thing. For the record, no matter what a person... Yeah. It's not what people say on Twitter. No, it's not what people say on Twitter, but... I mean, what good is it to bring the thing you hate to anybody? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're saying, hey, you didn't have enough sympathy, so I got no sympathy for you. Yeah. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. I don't think that's the way it works. I think if you pride yourself on being a sympathetic individual in general, then you got to apply it across the board. Mm -hmm. Logically and reasonably speaking. Now, maybe you curb it a little bit. But you certainly can't be out there wishing death on people. That's no way to live. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, though, it's on social media. But everything's on social media. Yeah. That that the, ain't no that that ain't no map. Stuff. That ain't no map for life over it's there. It's not. No. But that's what people see every day. Human beings. I mean, we have a hard enough time figuring out who to condemn when somebody's done something incredibly evil. Mm -hmm. We have a hard time figuring out what the punishment should be. And if you if it's ever worth wishing death upon somebody for anything, so to mm. just casually say that on social media, I mean, you got a question. You got to look yourself in the mirror if you're putting if you're spitting that into the universe. Mm. It's kind of fitting that I said spitting, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of the COVID spread. Anyway, so there's that. If he struggles with it and gets through it, I think that could also. Embolden the audience to, to to you have some sort of a hero story Success coming story. coming coming yeah. back from the brink, and then if something goes terribly wrong, and and I said I'm not wishing it, but it's totally possible. He's 74 years old. The other candidate is 77 years old. Biden. Yeah. First lady is also infected. First lady's you know. infected, but she's a bit younger. She looks she's healthy. Younger, I yeah. think she got it figured out. No. She got no problem. Hmm. She's gonna barrel through it. I'm just talking, but uh, 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 yeah. But if and then the last option is something terrible happens and the whole thing and people might think, oh, then it gets simpler. I don't think it gets simpler at all. There's a giant vacuum that's left mm -hmm. over, and it's a weird way to head into this uh, election. I don't know even how you do. I don't know what the rules are. You got the vice president Pence, but I, I don't think it's closure for people on either side of yeah. the argument. If that happens, and you've seen this happen in places where a leader, a high-profile leader, is is gone for whatever reason, and and the public, there can be a kind of a, like you said, a vacuum, a vacuum which results in a in a a kind of un unsettled civil unrest. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. And I'm not suggesting anybody do that. I, obviously, uh, wherever possible, to get along and respect one another, mm -hmm. that's what you should be trying to do wherever possible. The thing is, man, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about it, the thing is, it really feels as though people are watching things, and everybody's susceptible, myself included. It feels like people are watching things at such a distance, so isolated, based on how our lives are set up right now, that real life feels fictional, similar to what I was saying in the beginning. It feels like it's almost not even real people playing the roles, mm -hmm. in which case that distance allows for uh, the, the natural human empathy to be suppressed. Mm -hmm. And you can watch it like an armchair quarterback you can watch it as if 
the consequences aren't going to happen in real life, uh, but other, uh, in other words, they're happening in the imaginary land of social media that makes up your entertainment. Yeah, it's kind of like a video game right now. And it's, it's not healthy for anyone involved. It's obviously not healthy for those that you're sending it out to. And of course, this guy is as guilty as anyone for having participated in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that I think people don't consider enough that the effect that what they're participating in has on them. In other mm -hmm. words, regardless of what anyone has done, to see and watch yourself and also participate in the experience of it, in the broadcasting of whatever negative take you're shouting out, that, you own that now. Yeah. That's weight that's on you. Yeah. So, I don't know, just be considerate, I guess. I don't know. As much as possible, consider all the various factors that are out there. I, I don't know. What is this, a lesson? I work on this too, is what I'm trying to say. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to send a, a message. I work on this too, I think, before as much as possible about all the various angles associated with something, wherever possible. And, of course, stumble and make mistakes all the time. But I'm just saying uh, the human stuff. Try to bring the human stuff. Imagine if the person was right across from you. Imagine if the person was a relative imagine if the person uh imagine the person as a baby have you ever heard that before i mean huh. everybody's been a baby yeah you know i have a baby you look at a baby there's so much potential it could mm. go any way you have nothing but empathy and sympathy and they need you mm. and we all came that way we all started wow. that way we all developed we all got our problems we all got our issues yeah but like at the end of the day, man, it's all people. Yeah, we got to watch out for one another. They're all humans. You yeah. know. We're all humans. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, Jack just said that he's on the way to, ho to the hospital right now, I guess. Cool. So Stay anyway. Stay safe. It's... Uh, Will's trying to end it over there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we got nothing else to say. What can I say? Do your best. Yeah. Do your best.